awesome crowd. I am so excited to be here. Hello, everyone. My name is Taryn, and for the past 10 years, I've been a professional content creator. But to be perfectly honest, I can't actually remember a time in history where I wasn't creating. This is my first sketch video. Well, I've just been here doing one of my most favorite and fun things to do in the world, next to eating ice cream, reading. Clearly, before being beaten down by the harsh realities of life, this video was shot on my dad's old Panasonic VHS and edited using a VCR. This is my first piece of artwork, which I shot using a 1975 Nikon camera and developing in a middle school darkroom. My first website, a fan site, of course, for my beloved Beanie Baby collection created on GeoCities, complete with sparkly graphics that I coded myself. My first album, appropriately titled Hello World, which I basically made by giving a bunch of kids from band class Certificates to Blockbuster. Yeah. Oh, by the way, for those of you born after 1995, that is a CD. Uh, and finally, my first YouTube video, which I uploaded back in 2007. You know, if only Hillary Clinton had hired me for her last campaign, maybe things would have turned out different. Now, like all of my first creations, I didn't have high expectations with this video. But within a matter of weeks, this happened. In many ways, this one video gave me a front row seat to the, the digital revolution that was about to take place. And it's now been 10 years since I posted that video. I've made more than 1,500 internet videos for brands, as well as for my own YouTube channel, with more than 500 million views across the internet. I've produced three music, al three music albums and a plethora of other projects, including film and television. But the truth is, I'm no more creative than I was at 10 years old. I just have better tools. So throughout history, humans have used tools to give birth to plenty of new forms of storytelling, everything from books to music, television to now virtual reality. So what happens when our tools become more sophisticated? When we can direct a story using only our thoughts or edit content using artificial intelligence? or perhaps experience music as a sense of touch. Welcome to the future of storytelling. Now, usually when I speak on panels, people ask me to talk about what's it like to create video content online? How do I build an audience? How do I work with influencers? And that's all awesome. The digital media space is still a great space to be in. But I'm super excited to be here today to talk about the thing that gets me out of bed every single morning, and that's what's next. Now, thank goodness this isn't the last web or the current web, it's the next web, so I can imagine that most of you here in this room are pretty forward-thinking individuals. But whether you're a storyteller, a producer, an entrepreneur, or a marketer, every single person in this room faces a challenge, and that challenge is getting and keeping people's attention. Like it or not, attention is the new form of currency, but it's hard to capture and even harder to keep. And as we all know as storytellers, we can make bets on where we can find people's attention, where we can capture it, but that doesn't actually guarantee us a long runway for success. If you look throughout history, the list of innovative individuals and companies who once innovated in storytelling had a very difficult time doing that over time. Kodak, Blackberry, great examples of companies who valued nostalgia over innovation. And now that we have entered an era of exponential technology growth, the future becomes the past very, very quickly. If you're a Vine star, you know what I'm talking about. There is a tsunami of change coming, and the most successful future storytellers won't necessarily be the people who are best at telling stories, but those who are best at identifying and adopting new tools, platforms, and technologies for creation. So what are these tools, and how do we use them? Well, I promise I will get to that, but as it's often said, in order to see the future, we often have to look at the past. And in order to create the future, 
we first need to learn some lessons from the past. And in my 10 years as a digital media creator, I learned an awful lot of lessons. Namely, three things that creators need in order to successfully transition into a new form of storytelling. And hopefully, these lessons will help all of you as you contemplate the future. So number one, you need a problem. Back in 2007, the process of making it in Hollywood was virtually impossible. If you were an aspiring actor, you basically had to sign your life away to a television show like American Idol, which I did, or you had to send out thousands of headshots the old snail mail way to agents and managers throughout Los Angeles, which I also did. And if you were lucky enough to get an agent and get your foot in the door and get that audition, now you were competing against 100 other people, super talented, who look exactly like you. And most likely, one of them is the daughter of the director. Not great odds. <laughs> it took me five years and more than 100 auditions to book my first role in a TV show. And if you're an aspiring writer, the odds are even worse. Based on the number of registered screenplays by the Writers Guild of America, you have a one in 5,000 odds of selling a screenplay. Your odds of dying on a bicycle are one in 4,472. And since we're in Amsterdam, I'd say those are better odds. Then along comes YouTube. It's this platform for cat videos and pranks and all kinds of content far beneath Hollywood's sophisticated taste buds. But for the average creator just looking for a break, this platform offered one simple solution, the chance to be seen. The actor who could never get an audition could finally have a real life audience, and the writer who could never get anything produced could finally make something. So, a small group of creators identified this solution and they started making online content, initially to get the attention of Hollywood. They had no money, no employees, no resources, no connections, but instead of just count their problems, they became problem solvers. The funny thing was, Hollywood did not pay any attention to them. And why should they? They were too busy making tons of money eating $10 granola bars at craft service, hanging on to old dreams. But even though Hollywood didn't want to pay attention, the rest of the world did. Many of these early YouTube creators went on to become some of the largest channels and networks on YouTube. A few were part of the founding team at Maker Studios, which sold to Disney for a cool $1 billion. Actually, it ended up being $500 million, but who's counting? Um, others have gone on to sell their channels to other entities like CNN and Discovery Channel and have audiences in the tens of millions. Now look, maybe you're just a super happy person and you have no problems. So I don't know, maybe you need to become less happy. Uh, but no, really, we can all learn how to become better problem seekers. One way to create a problem is to ask yourself, if I was competing with myself, how might I do that? That might surface some new problems. Another way to create problems is by forcing constraints, whether it's time constraints, resource constraints, or capital restraints. This will inevitably lead you to new tools to solve this new problem. I would not recommend, however, forcing problems on your relationship. Don't do that. Problems are good for business, not for love. All right, so now we move on to the second lesson in adapting to the future. Once you have a problem, you can start looking for new tools to solve it. In one of my favorite studies, it's in the book, The Originals, by author Adam Grant, uh, there's a study wherein you can determine exactly how long a customer service rep will last in their job simply by looking at the browser of their choice. Now, there are two groups of people in this study, Chrome Firefox people and Safari Internet Explorer people. Which one do you think lasted in their jobs longer? Any guesses? Anyone? Firefox. Firefox. There we go. Chrome Firefox people. <laughs> Why is this? If you own a Mac, your default browser is Safari. 
If you own a PC, your default browser is Internet Explorer. And everyone knows that these browsers aren't great. So for you to actually use Chrome Firefox, you would have had to research a better tool that's out there, take the initiative to download it, reset your default settings, all of which show signs that you are an initiator, a problem solver, and an out-of-the-box thinker. And of course, as a customer service rep, those are excellent qualities to have if you want to last long in your job. YouTube creators were the Chrome Firefox users, right? When they saw a difficult path to winning in Hollywood, they found a very unlikely solution in YouTube. And in the absence of a lot of options, they then started looking for tools that would help them along this path. So with little, resource, with little resources, the YouTube community basically started experimenting with all kinds of cool things, like you know, DSLRs with cheap fixed lenses, and iPhones, and websites like Wix, so that they could create their own website, using banner tools like PicMonkey uh, and Fiverr to design logos, making music with GarageBand. Meanwhile, in Hollywood, it would take 70 people in 10 different departments, and a seven-figure budget to accomplish the same thing. It's one of my favorite quotes. We cannot solve our problems with the same thinking we use to create them. And this isn't necessarily a slam on Hollywood, but thinking outside the box isn't always easy. It doesn't fit well in a current system. But again, you guys are all forward thinkers, right? So that's not an issue. You've got a problem. And now maybe you have some ideas of some cool tools on how to solve it. So what's the third lesson in thinking about the future? Make stuff again and again and again and again. And when you try and fail, you do it again, <laughs> AKA the master of consistent output. And this step is so important. It's so crucial. And it's the reason why some creators have made eight-figure exits and others have given up. It's, uh, it's the process that doesn't feel creative, the process of scaling a business and refining technique. And quite honestly, it's the thing that I've had the toughest time with as a creator. I also refer to it as the creation gap, which is basically the distance between having an idea and being able to execute on it. And sometimes that gap feels like a massive chasm. So when I first started my channel, um, I'd had several videos on YouTube with several million views, but I had no audience, because the key to building an audience was consistent output. But I had two problems. My videos were expensive. I was doing these big music videos with lots of production. Um, and editing took up a ton of time. It took me three, three weeks just to edit a video. So I ended up hiring two people as freelancers to help me with this process and started bank shooting videos and this is what happened. If you see the, the increase in the graph, that's from when I hired two freelance people to help me out as uh, subscribers gained over time. And this leads me to the other benefit of consistent output, which is data. I could see exactly who was watching my content, for how long, from where, where the drop off was, and then I could make tweaks to my content and marketing accordingly. But I wasn't the only YouTuber learning how to scale this. Others were too. Consistent data taught us three things as YouTubers. One, the flexibility to make market changes. We could actually catch some of the changes to the YouTube algorithm before they even announced it. Uh, and it also allowed us to catch a tailwind when certain videos hit big. The second thing we learned was new format creation. Who knew that challenge videos and unboxing toys and personal vlogs would become the norm? We sure didn't, but we found that out through data. The third thing we learned, and probably the most important, was the benefit of collaboration in building an audience. We saw that if we collaborated with YouTubers with similar audiences as ourselves, using tools like Tubular or VidStats, that we could quickly receive new viewers. This was so apropos to convention, it would be like NBC and ABC cross-promoting and collaborating with each other. Meanwhile, Hollywood was using this thing, a Nielsen box for statistics and data. 
Now, for those of you who have never heard of a Nielsen box, it's fine. It's, it's what Hollywood uses to determine television ratings, and it's about as relevant as a VCR. It also looks like one, too. I mean, seriously, this thing is like trying to bake a cake using a tractor. It's incredibly, incredibly unreliable. So what did all of this do to Hollywood? These are just some of the headlines that have uh, surfaced over the past five years of the digital revolution. Now, not only had YouTubers rewritten the tools and the rules of this new digital ecosystem, but there was now a new audience hungry for new types of content that Hollywood knew nothing about. So while Hollywood had mastered the art of storytelling in some mediums, they were too late to the digital party. And essentially, they got beat in a game they never knew they had to play. Then they got their big shot. In 2013, YouTube announced they'd be spending $200 million on premium content. They wanted to increase ad revenue for their system, and they thought this was the way to do it. So instead of giving the money to the people who had revolutionized their platform, they gave checks to traditional Hollywood systems who were used to playing by old rules and old tools. And what happened? Today, only a few of those channels remain, and YouTube has erased pretty much all references online to their original con content initiative. So YouTube's plan failed. All right, so what now? The exciting stuff. Here we are in 2017. Um, YouTube was once this big path towards innovation, for myself primarily, but competition has become very fierce. Over 300 hours of video are uploaded every single minute, and there are more than one million creators who are part of YouTube's partner program. That's a lot. And on top of that, Hollywood is now spending millions of dollars on their digital content initiatives, and they're doing quite well. And on top of that, creators, to stay competitive, are now having to make between three and seven videos a week, sometimes on multiple channels. It's a pretty tough hamster wheel to run on. It's become clear that if you already haven't built an audience on YouTube, it can be very, very difficult to do so. I call that a problem. Great. <laughs> So now we have a problem. Now we just need to look for new tools to solve it. So about two years ago, I started looking at new tools, stuff like VR and AR, experimenting with these new platforms, looking for solutions. I found that VR was this incredibly immersive, interactive experience that could give birth to new forms of stories. And with tools like 3D visual mapping data, I could now see where my viewers were looking within a headset to direct their attention as a storyteller. And with biofeedback tools, I could also take a look at the uh, heart rate or sweat or glucose levels of my viewers to determine how my content was actually affecting their physiological state. That's pretty cool. <laughs> we also already know from studies that VR has proven more powerful than morphine in managing the pain of burn victims in hospitals. I also started looking into spatial audio and haptics, and other tools to create immersive experiences for our viewers using 360 sound and haptic touch. Now, sound healing has a very long history, so this could be used for therapeutic purposes. And haptic feedback allows people to experience sensations. So I was actually just at Tribeca and tried out a new experience called Tree in which you wear a haptic vest to experience what it's like being a tree in the rainforest, growing, 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 all the way to your fiery demise. And finally, some of the most exciting new tools currently available to creators, BCI and AI. We'll start with BCI, Brain to Computer Interfaces. On the, on the, on the more simple side, we can look at EEG which is a tool used to record brain frequencies like alpha, gamma, delta waves. And we could use these to, re to register a viewer's response to our content and potentially impact their mental state. In the future, these technologies may even allow viewers to direct content using only their thoughts. And then there's AI. Many of you may have heard about the very first movie trailer, which was edited using artificial intelligence, IBM. Watson, it was 
recently released, but the creative applications for this are absolutely endless. Because AI can analyze massive amounts of data and create new learning patterns for creation, we could potentially collaborate with other artists of the past. So maybe you want to write a play with Shakespeare or a rap song with Tupac. It's possible. It could now happen because of AI. So what's to become of the future? I have a few predictions. One, I think that we'll see a greater democratization of the creation process. Just as we saw with YouTube creators being able to make stuff from their bedrooms, the access to this, to this technology will only get better. Two, I think we'll see new formats, more experiential storytelling. Instead of stories that have a beginning, middle, and end, people will want to just take part in experiences. We can't apply old Hollywood stories to VR and AR. We have to create them ourselves. Finally, I think we'll see a new career for scientist storytellers. These are people that really understand the intersection of both of those things. Now that we have the tools to actually understand how our content has a physiological response on ourselves, it's important that we have these people in our communities. Now, there are some consequences to some of this. Content is very powerful. As we saw throughout the year in election cycles, how much content impacts movements, recruitment of even ISIS members. We have to be thoughtful about how we move forward in discussing using this technology as it comes out in the future. Now, as some of you might have guessed from my speech, I am no longer hedging my bets all on YouTube. I still think YouTube's great. If you want to be a digital media superstar, it is the place to be. Uh, but I saw a problem emerge in that ecosystem, and so I started experimenting with new tools like 360 video and haptics and spatial audio, and I'm now working on two projects that incorporate the tools I just described. One of the projects I'm working on explores the future of the human brain, and this project is being directed by Morgan Spurlock. And over the next year, we'll be following seven of the top neurotech companies as they do groundbreaking research on the brain. In fact, uh, this is an iPhone video I took while on set. Uh, we were recording a, um, a patient's neurons, a patient with epilepsy. We were recording their neurons through an electrode that was implanted in their hippocampus, where memories are stored. And by listening to these neurons, which really just look like a bunch of wacky patterns on the screen, scientists are hoping to figure out how to decode them. So once we figure this out, can we program the brain like we currently do our DNA? And if we can read and write neural code, how might this influence the coevolution of humans and machines? These are very big questions. The other project I'm working on a new music album, but with a 2.0 twist. Now, I, I still don't actually play an instrument other than the piano, and I still have no idea how to use fancy production software. So in many ways, I'm no better off than I was at 10 years old making my first album. But I have a new collaboration partner this time. And my partner is super fast with instrumentation, has an extensive background knowledge of music theory, and maybe best of all, has never been tired, cranky, or threatened to sue me. As you may have guessed, my collaborator is not human. It is an AI robot. So to demonstrate to you all what we can do together, I decided to put a little challenge together for myself right before leaving on my flight to Amsterdam. I had two hours to write and produce a hook for a song. And so I picked my tool, in this case, uh, an AI platform called Amper. And here's a little snippet of that. Oops, didn't mean to do that. Time goes by, always calculated, never satisfied. So I lie here waiting for a second chance, for a second I can play more if anyone wants to hear more later, 
but that was made in two hours using only artificial intelligence and myself. Now look, it's definitely no Hello World, my first album, but uh, fortunately I did not have to bribe any kids with Blockbuster gift certificates to get it done. So, you know what? It's pretty chill. <laughs> I will uh, end on a famous quote here, which is the best way to predict the future is to create it. And if that means, if, and if that, means that I'll be collaborating with robots as a YouTuber looking to the future, I'm pretty darn excited about it. So thank you very much.